the subject really today is three different subjects. Um, and the first is movement. I have been just fascinated with human movement for my entire life. And the way the brain runs movement has fascinated me since, since I was very young. And I submit that we don't know very much about that, number one. And number two, the model that we've been using for that is getting badly outdated rather quickly. The idea that a muscle attaches to a tendon that goes across a joint that is limited by the bone shape and the ligaments, and therefore movement comes about on a leverage principle on Newton's laws. Einstein came a hundred years ago. We're just now bringing a relativistic uh, point of view to human movement. So we looked at spatial medicine, and we see that this is the model of what I was talking about. A muscle goes across a joint, and that's how it works on the body. I would suggest instead spatial system, big unitary net. And it transmits and accommodates the forces not in a way of just the tendons going from bone to bone, but a whole system of a cobweb, a three-dimensional cobweb, pulling in on a bone system that's pushing out. We'll also talk, we'll talk a little more later, but we'll talk about the, uh, how it responds and transmits. But if you have this idea that the skeletal system is pushing out, and the myofascial system, meaning the muscle and the fascia together, the white stuff and the red stuff, are pulling in. That yin and yang, the pulling in of the soft tissue and the pushing out of the bones, is the balance which ends up being our posture, our movement, our posture in action, um, the recognizable pattern of movement that we have throughout our life. So you can change that by training, or you can change that by changing the fascial stuff itself. So what you want in those fascial layers is that they slide and glide easily on each other. That's what allows you full range of movement and easy coordination of your movement for whatever motion you're going to do. The trouble is when it becomes dry or overused, so it dries out, it loses its fluidity, or it gets overused, which makes inflammation, which means it loses its fluidity, can make this fascia stick together. Most of your body sensing you're, you're feeling your fascia six times more than your muscles. You have six times more endings in your fascia than you do in your muscles on average. Um, so you're really feeling this system as you stretch it and it's telling you what's going on. And finally, all injuries, if you're working especially with a chronic injury, has a fascial component to it. So it's worthwhile learning about this. Fascia has properties that are really important in training. I'm going to leave that here, except for one, which is the second one, elasticity. I'd 
like you to notice just how much effort I am using to keep the carabiner going up and down. I could do this all day. If I was doing this, how long would it take me? So what we've discovered is that the fascia is viscous, like you see on the screen, but also elastic, as you see here. So it has viscoelastic properties, and this elasticity means it can store and give back, store and give back, store and give back energy, and that's what the runners who are using the four foot running are storing and giving back, storing, giving back, so they're not hitting the wall so soon because they're not using up the stores of sugar in their body by doing concentric contractions. If you look at my hand, I'm doing an almost isometric contraction to keep this thing going. I have to do a little contraction to keep it going. If I just stopped contracting whatsoever, it would stop going. But with just a little bit of a contraction, I can keep myself moving along, if you understand. And if you start to look, I draw your attention to this structure, we start to see the relationship between the fascia and the bones as being one where the bones are floating inside a balanced set of fascial poles. So these sticks are not touching each other. And the response of the system is a response of the whole system. And when you injure a system and one part becomes fixed, then the rest of it doesn't respond properly around that. And the pain may end up over here even though the injury is over here. So understanding our body in a different way from robotic idea, which has gotten us a lot of knowledge over the last several hundred years, but that model is running out of its usefulness. This model is, I think, going to be more useful as we move forward to understand athlete movement. If you start thinking about the fascia in a dynamic way, then your treatment plans and operations change. So whatever demand you put on the body, you're going to get that body. You can recognize what running does to a body because it's a running demand. You can recognize what Olympic lifting does to a body because it's an Olympic lifting demand and different bodies are suited to different bits. But if you don't do enough to stimulate the cell, you're going to get fibrosis and lacks of flexibility and a lack of strength. If you overdo it, you're going to get another kind of fibrosis and edema around the cell. And if you just do enough, that's the gray one in the middle, then you'll maintain the status quo. But trainers are looking for that green idea of building the fascia. Now, fascia builds slower than muscle. You can't get the fascial system to build up as fast as a muscle. That's why lots of people get injuries. The consequence of this is we start to look at how the muscles are strung together in the body to create these things that I call anatomy trains or myofascial meridians to understand the way in which the body pattern works um, as a tensegrity so that we can understand how these things are communicated from one place to the other.